Well, good morning, Eastview. Hey, I'm not alone today. I got a friend. <laughs> Everybody, this is Jamie. Everybody say, hey, Jamie. Oh, hi there. <laughs> Jamie is so excited to be here with us this morning. Aren't you, honey? Oh, so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I am so grateful that uh, she said yes in so many ways, but um, uh, 18 years ago, but also for this today as well. And so we are going to share it with you this morning, just as we continue the series, as Tyler mentioned earlier, confessions and convictions, stepping into the notion of those things that we hold so strong and dear, con convictions in terms of marriage and parenting, and then also uh, just confessions, places that we're like, man, we have got a lot to learn in this category still, and so we wish that you were up here teaching us in these areas as well. So um, the, the purpose of this kind of introductory series is really, I said last week, is hopefully having a way for you to get a chance to know me as the new lead pastor, to, to forge some friendship, relationship, trust moving forward, and I felt like if you're gonna know me, then you need to know Jamie because you know she's my better half, and also like to know me is to know my wife, and and so uh, we're excited to to be able to share with you this morning. You ready for this? Ready. Let's you ready? Go. Okay. So um, we're gonna have Jamie here in a minute. She's gonna share a little bit of her story since you heard mine last week, and then we'll kind of share our story, and then some confessions and convictions in the realms of marriage and parenting. Um, but we love to be able to pray uh, to start. And so uh, I'm actually going to, I know you just sat down, um, but I would love for you to stand back up with us. And we love to just pray as a church family together and then jump in to this. So Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time. We ask that you would speak to us. God, no matter what phase of life, season of life that we're in, that you would meet us, God. As we talk about marriage and parenting and ultimately family, God, we, we recognize the most significant family, God, is that as the family of God and you as our heavenly father. And so God, would you meet us where we're at, speak to us, and Lord, we're excited just to, to be in your presence and to be with one another. And we offer this time to you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said? Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. So, I wanna jump in and share a little bit about who is Jamie Grant. Yes, well, hi, Eastview. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so my name is Jamie. Um, I am the middle of three girls. I grew up in the Chicagoland, a suburb called Batavia. Um, my dad became a Christian pretty radically in college, um, and he hitchhiked to Illinois to go, he grew up in South Dakota, he hitchhiked to Illinois to go to Moody Bible Institute um, and began a career in ministry. My mom um, was a missionary kid in Zimbabwe. My grandparents were missionaries out there for 30 years. And so we were just highly involved in church growing up. I grew up in a very healthy home, and I would say that I made my faith my own um, probably in high school. Um, my, my, after I graduated high school, I went to community college for a year and then went over to Cedarville in Ohio for a year uh, and then um, needed to be back in the public school setting. And so I came to ISU um, my junior year. And then that's where I met Brandon. Tell us more. In college. Yeah, tell me more, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, a girlfriend of mine brought me to Fuel, which was the college ministry here at ACU at the time. And uh, she, I knew I needed to get plugged into a church. And so she brought me here. And I remember the very first time we were here, uh, there was this really cute guy on stage leading the music. And I remember looking at my girlfriend and just being that like, that who is that? That's me, right? Okay. <laughs> so, There's that was Jesus, Brandon. Sure. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and so then I got to meet him a couple weeks later when he opened the door for me. Um, and we actually went out on a couple of dates. He got my number from my small group leader, which was very covert. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's advantages of having the church database system at your disposal. I just say it like. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we went out on a couple dates. Um, and then I actually had been dating a guy in the summer that had broken up with me, so we actually ended up getting back together, um, and that kind of ended our quick little bout of seeing each other. You put that so, so kindly. <laughs> 
<laughs> you weren't that disappointed because he started dating someone like really soon afterwards. So. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I, so anyways, I dated that other guy for a little while, and then my, um, the summer going into my senior year, I really wrestled, and um, we were getting really serious at that point, um, talking about engagement and marriage, and I just did not feel a piece about it, and so I actually ended things um, with him at that point, which was really hard, because I, all I really wanted was to be a wife and a mom, and, you know... I was really going to college just to get married, let's be honest. <laughs> so um, that was what I was there for, but um, yeah. And so as she ended up breaking things off with this other guy, um, I did. Uh, I was dating someone as well and starting to consider whether or not this was going to move uh, past just dating to maybe engagement and getting married. Um, and there was... Uh, a moment where there were three straight nights that I actually had the exact same dream. And in the dream, I was standing at front of an aisle at a wedding. I was the groom. And the bride coming down the aisle was actually Jamie. Um, this is a problem when you're dating somebody else not named Jamie. Um, so uh, I, I, I was like, what do I do with that? I remember meeting with a pastor friend and said, hey, here's what's going on. And he said, well, I'm not really sure what to tell you about the whole Jamie part, but maybe that'll give you an answer about the girl you're currently dating. And so I ended up breaking things off with her. And, and then not too long after, reaching back out to, to Jamie, and we met actually at Potbelly's there on uh, North Main on ISU's campus, and just uh, trying to catch up and see where she was at. I, I had heard that she was single. I don't know if you knew that I had broke up with this girl. I didn't. Yeah, so she was like, this is kind of weird. And, <laughs> Um, and I chose not to uh, tell her that, hey, I had a dream three straight nights that you were my wife. That's <laughs> super creepy. So I, I didn't do that. Um, but did express like a, a general interest again. And then we went out a couple more times. Mm -hmm. and, and as we started to like see, okay, there's, there's something here this time, I think. Um, Jamie actually had this time where she said, I think that we should take a few days or a week and, and just pause, pray fast and see if this is what God would have for us. And so... Uh, we did that, and, and then we met back up together uh, at the coffee house in Uptown Normal, and it was uh, in the morning, and when we got there, I mean, Jamie jumped right in and just simply just asked me, I just want to know why you are interested in me. And I proceeded then to kind of share with her some different things about, you know, internal, external beauty and stuff like that. And then as I was about ready to finish up and she was going to say something, I, I, I told her, I said, and also, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I, I just have this overwhelming desire to serve you. I believe that marriage is based more upon what you give than what you receive. And so I just, I need you to know, I just, I just feel like I'm supposed to tell you, I, I want to, to serve you. And, and Jamie kind of began to look like tear up and I'm thinking, oh crap, you know, what was that? Was that not a good answer? Um, and then she proceeded to tell me that essentially that she had asked God to make me say those words. <laughs> well, I think that I was at the point in my life where I just, I never wanted to casually date. And so um, I think at that point I was like, God, I really want, I don't want to, this is my senior year of college. I didn't want to just date um, just to date. And so I had been to a women's conference at some point, like, in that week span that we were kind of taking a break. And the speaker talked about um, marriage just being about serving one another and it being more about what you give to the other person and how you sacrifice and serve them than it is about receiving. And so um, I came home and just as I was journaling that and, and really praying about Brandon, um, I just was like, okay, Lord, like th if this is my husband, then I want these words to come out of his mouth. <laughs> and so when he did, I, I didn't tell him that, but I did know personally that, that he was the man that I was going to marry. And when she told me like, hey, I, I kind of put a fleece out and asked God that you'd say that. And I had no idea in my head. I was like, well, we really don't have an option. Like we've got to get married. <laughs> um, and that's a good thing. And, and so we moved pretty quick at that point. That was in early March of 20, 2006. And then we were engaged in April 2006 and then married July 29th, 2006. And so the whole thing was about six months. And now of, of, as being parents of four kids, I'm not sure if I would advocate if my kids came to me and said, hey, we're getting married in six months. I'd be like, hold on a second. Um, 
But I did ask for, you know, Jamie's dad, his blessing, and, and he did a three-hour interrogation of me, um, <laughs> spanning topics of my financial stability, my eschatology, my ministry philosophy. He said, hey, I got this guy that can, like, look and find anything on a computer. Like, could I have it? And would you be okay with that? And, and I was like, dude, your dad's intense. Um, it's intense. But what was so cool is at the end of that three hours, he said, you know, Jamie's mom and I have prayed since she was a little girl for her husband, and it's incredible to be able to now put a face to those prayers we've been praying since she was so young. And so, you know, it's now been 18 years uh, that we've been married, and it's all been amazing, all blissful, all glorious, no problems whatsoever. <laughs> um, now we'll share more about that in just a moment. Uh, but 18 years of marriage, and we also have four kiddos. So maybe you want to just introduce... Yeah. Uh, our church family here to our four kids. Yeah, so I think their picture is going to be on the screen. Look at how cute they are. They're all so <laughs> cute. Um, so my oldest is Elise, and she just turned 14. She is our creative. She loves art and theater and personality tests and being unique. Um, <laughs> and then Shepard is 11. He loves baseball, fishing, um, sports. Uh, he loves taking things apart and putting them back together. He kind of has that engineering mind. Hope is nine, and Hope is our nurturer. She is our sensitive spirit. She is so sweet and loves little kids and people. Um, she loves learning in school. And then Connor is our youngest, and he's I thought wild. the he's fourth was going to be just go with the flow, and he's not. He is wild and loud and talks with a voice that just fills the room. Um, and he loves... I don't know where he gets that from. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, so yeah. he's our baby. So four kiddos, all starting school for the first time this coming week at Tri-Valley, so all new experiences for them. Um, and so we would just ask for you to be praying for our family in that whole uh, new season. So, so that's a little bit about us, our love story, if you will. We like it. It's, it's ours. And, um, and just thought it would be important for you to kind of hear a little bit of how we came together. And then we want to spend just the, the back half uh, in our time just talking about some confessions and convictions in terms of marriage and parenting. And I, I, before we jump fully in, I do want to acknowledge, I know that that's not the season of life that everyone is in here. Some of you are yet to be in that season. Some of you are past that season. Some of you are never going to be in that season at all. Um, but I, I hope, because this is the season we find ourselves in, and for you to get to know us, we wanted to share that. I hope there are things, though, that we share that would be able to, to speak and, and bless everyone in here today. Um, and we'll address a couple different groups of people as well throughout. So um, let's start with marriage. And uh, we'll start, this week we're going to start with some convictions, and then we'll move into the confessions piece. Um, and really the first marriage conviction that, that we, we share, that we believe is scripturally anchored, um, and really is our definition of marriage, is simply that marriage is God's idea and it's a covenant meant for a lifetime between a man and a woman. And, and so let me break that down. And, and first off, it's just this idea that, that marriage is God's idea. Like Jamie and I, we're pro-marriage. Uh, we don't have a salty view of it. We, we believe in it. We love it because we believe God made it. God is good. And so marriage and God's ideal is to be good. That it said that it's not good for a man to be alone and the two would become one flesh. And so we believe that and are grateful um, we, you know, I would say are fortunate that you know, my parents, before my dad passed away, were married 42 years. Um, Jamie's parents are, are still together and married for 40 plus years. Uh, neither of us on our grandparents' side have had divorce. So, so we have been fortunate to, to have great examples of marriage, which has probably also helped us think marriage is such a great thing. But at the end of the day, it's, it's God's idea. And so we lean into that and are excited about that and all that comes with marriage. Um, it's a covenant. It's not to be entered flippantly. It's something to be taken pretty seriously. And so when you say, I do, it's a, it's a big deal. And so we, we did not just, even though we got together quickly, we did not take it lightly that we were saying, I do to one another. And we do believe that it's meant for a lifetime. That marriage ultimately, Scripture would paint it as this picture of, of representing God's love and his heart for his people or his church. And so it, with God being kind of the groom, as I mentioned last week, and people being in the position of the bride, um, we, we want our marriage to, to last a lifetime because we think that that's what God's love declares, is that God's love is unending and abounding for generation upon generation. And so we strive to say, how do we 
how do we make this thing work and how do we keep thriving in this for a lifetime? And, and we do hold to this conviction that it's in God's idea and what's best that it was between a man and a woman. And, and that that is something that we, we hold as very sacred. Now, in, in sharing that and us being completely pro-marriage and all about it and love it, um, and Jamie will tell you more in just a moment, like, like, that we are still working on this a lot, I think one of the confessions that is important for us to share is that there, I think that this is a confession, not just for Jamie and I, but sometimes a confession for the whole church at large, is that there are groups of people that sometimes get left out or minimized or not seen um, when it comes to marriage. And, and in the Christian faith, it seems like, at least in the Western world, that marriage is held like the quintessential like peak, like this is what you gotta do is get married and have kids and have a family. And if you don't get there, then you're like a second class citizen. And I would just say, first off, to the groups of people, the confession is, the, the first group is to those who are single in this room. Whether you're waiting to get married or you've been married and no longer married, but, like, but, but those who are single and, and feel like, like what, are we, uh, what am I supposed to do because I'm, I'm not married, I don't have kids. We, we declare, because scripture declares, singlehood is a gift. It is a gift and not all people may get married and that's completely okay. And God would uniquely want to bless your life and through your singleness, your life to be used by him to reach other people for him. The other group of people sometimes are those that it's meant for a lifetime, but let's be honest, it doesn't always last a lifetime. There are a lot of people that their marriages have ended and we're always going to be pro-marriage in terms of fighting for marriage and seeking hope and healing and you know, forgiveness and reconciliation. But sometimes things don't make it. And sometimes there's valid reasons for them to not keep going on based upon what's happened. But the church at large sometimes is this place that people are already, as they're struggling through divorce, feel the weight and the pain and the heaviness of what they're dealing with. And then they come into the church and they feel like they have more guilt and shame heaped upon them. Um, we want to meet people where they're at, understand each person's story and walk with them versus like judge them from the outcast or from the onset. And then the idea of it be between a, a man and a woman. I'm, I'm sure in later sermons, we'll talk more in depth about all of these things. But I also know that there are different cultural expressions and even expressions of marriage, not just between a man and a woman, but same sex and other things. And while we will have a conviction of God's best and ideal being in that form of a man and a woman, uh, we'll tell you that we also know that there, there, there needs to be empathy and understanding as we lean in when people come to church and, and maybe express something differently than that and to see where they're coming from and understand that. Uh, living in California for, for 12 years, um, I would say one of the great advantages that we had is we got to meet so many wonderful people that express their love differently. And while we can hold convictions, it doesn't mean that we cannot still have kindness and empathy and understanding and also try to learn as we move forward. And our hope and prayer for Eastview Christian Church is that in all of those groups that we would start by coming beside someone, understand who they are, and then walking together forward but it doesn't mean we have to like shift what we're convicted on, but our confession is, can we actually be nice and kind along the way, which sometimes I feel like the church hasn't always done. There's a couple of you, thank you. And I would also say what our confession is also. Yeah, I just think that our confession too is that we don't have all the answers. Like that is a very complex and messy and com complicated thing that we are free in Christ, yet we hold scripture as truth. And so how do we like, how do we come alongside people and love people well, and, but also understanding that, that we don't know all the answers, we don't have it all figured out. Yeah. And that our marriage is a work in process as well. And we're looking for a lifetime. And right now we're in about the, first quarter, maybe second quarter. Um, and by the time we get to the fourth, we might need Steph Curry to heave some threes. I don't know. Like, we'll see. Like, um, that was amazing yesterday, by the way. I don't know if you saw that, but um, all right. Marriage conviction number two, marriage thrives when mutual submission, love, and respect are all being practiced. That 
And if there is a, a, a triad of components or a, a cocktail, if you will, of, of elements to really help a marriage thrive, we see scripturally, it would be this idea of mutual submission, love, and respect all being practiced. And, and we find this in Ephesians chapter five, if you wanna read that for us. Yeah, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit, to your, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the, Christ, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And that first verse, verse 21, it says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we, we believe wholeheartedly that both of us are to play the game of limbo in marriage, right? Limbo is how low can you go? And it's my role to go as low as I can to lift Jamie up and it's Jamie's role to go as low as she can go to lift me up in order that the both of us be trying to lift each other up. It's just mutual submission, it's not just one. Um, but then it also says that wives are to submit to their husbands. Yeah, and I think that we see that why the wife's primary role is to submit to their husbands, but it's also, it says in, in up here, it says, submit to their husbands as you do to the Lord. And so Brandon will share in a minute just um, the calling of the husband, but um, it's this idea of yielding to the other person. There's a mutual yielding. Um, and if Brandon's yielding to me and I'm yielding to him, then there's mutual kindness and love and consideration towards each other and we're building each other up. So we're both called to submit, but primarily um, I think there's something inside every man that desires to lead and has um, just this God-given call to lead their families. And so wives, this is our role to like come underneath our husbands and submit to him and to respect this call that God's given him to lead their families. And then it says for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And so I, I think it's important first to see that it says mutual submission, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then it says wives submit, but then it also says Husbands love, and that idea of love isn't like a cakewalk by any means, because like how did Christ love the church? He was willing to lay his life down for her. And, and I think that oftentimes it's when husbands don't love well that wives are like, that I'm not gonna follow. Like you're not, you're not loving in the way Jesus loves. And many people even read 1 Corinthians 13 at their actual wedding day, which describes what love is supposed to be. Right? It says love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. I mean, husbands in here, men in here, just put your name there where it says love and see how well you're doing as a husband. And tell me how easy at times that is, right? This, this is a call to selfless as a sacrifice. To say Brandon is patient and Brandon is kind and Brandon is not envy and, and Brandon, I mean, these are all true. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. A lot of the time. Oh, a lot thanks, of the time. Thanks, thanks. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we both are called to move to this point of selflessness and sacrifice and and to love and serve one another. But and I think that when husbands do this, right, like it is so much easier to submit. When Brandon's being strong-willed and I'm being strong-willed, like we buck heads a lot. But like when he's submitting and I'm submitting, then we are able to build each other up a yeah. lot better. Yeah, and in terms just of our marriage, like, like I said, we love our marriage and we love each other and we fight for each other. But it's important for you to know, like, we have so much to learn from so many of you as well. Um, and, and we have moments where, right, our, our, our temperament is not the best, uh, our words are not the kindest, sometimes we'll go in separate rooms and not talk to each other. I mean, we, we do those things too. I'm sure you don't. <laughs> Right, like, or, or if she decides to tell me how to drive, I don't like that, like, I mean, so we're, we're pretty normal and human, you know, and so we're always working things out. Our marriage is a work in process, but we're committed to it. Yeah, and I think that the intentionality of it is 
necessary because I think everybody in marriage, if you've married any amount of time, you know that there are seasons that are really great and there are seasons that just are really hard and that are like just you're trying to get through them. Um, and so just remembering that there, there are ebbs and flows, there's up and downs in marriage, but you have to continue to keep that um, in, your, in your mind about um, how can I submit, how can I love. And I think that comes back, just to kind of close this point up, is that idea of a covenant. Like it's a covenant based upon a commitment, not upon my feelings and demeanor in that moment. And if feelings are at the forefront of our marriage commitment, a lifetime's virtually impossible. And I think that's, so we sometimes have to push beyond just how we feel in the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's ups and downs. Yeah. So, all right, now we've figured out marriage. Maybe we should tell them about parenting a little bit. Okay, well, let me start with Uh, a confession. Okay. Um, (laughs) So with parenting, sometimes I get nervous talking about something that I don't feel like I have figured out in any way. But we all don't have it figured out, right? So like, I don't think that would be the right posture to come into it either. Um, But we're still very much in the chemistry lab. I mean, we're barely hitting teenage years, so we are still learning a lot. We're still reading books. We're still praying about it. We're still training. And um, just for example, we brought a friend back with us from California last week, and she was a part of Rise City for several years, and she got to stay with us for Three, three days, yeah. and it was wonderful, but I'm pretty sure she went back with a more healthy view of our family <laughs> and our human, humanness, yeah. humanity um, than she had when she came in, because our kids were off schedule, you know? We were two weeks of traveling and eating sugar and staying up late, and um, it was just kind of, kind of crazy. So. It was normal. Very and, normal. And I, and I would contend that Jesus' ability to live an earthly life that was perfect was because he didn't have kids. So I've always believed that. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems logical to me. <laughs> Uh, But parenting conviction, number one, parents are to be the primary spiritual encouragers and influence in their child's life. Um, This is not something that we can outsource, parents. This has to be something that we take ownership of and we um, commit to in our homes and not just on Sunday mornings or at youth group. So Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So what I love so much about this passage is when it says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So parents, first, we have to make sure that these commandments are on our hearts. So we cannot pass on what we don't possess ourselves. Um, so they, they have to, these commands have to be working in our hearts. They're not going to be completed. They just need to be working in our hearts um, before we can pass them on. And so when you, um, as you seek to love your children, invite them into your rhythms, invite them into your, the messiness of your relationship with God, right? Your, your pitfalls and your encouraging moments. Um, if you read something in scripture, tell your kids about it. If you're convicted about something, confess it to your kids, pray with your kids. Um, none of our walks with God are flawless and our kids don't need perfect parents. They just need to see parents that are authentic, parents that love God and, and, me- and when they mess up, they can see the grace of God cover over. Um, So one of the things we try to do consistently is say sorry to our kids because we lose our temper, we mess up, and I think when we say sorry to our kids, it shows them that that we are human and this is why we need Jesus and this is why um, we need grace. We also, with with that idea of, of raising kids, is we want our kids to not always stay living with us forever. <laughs> and we want to prepare them um, for what the future holds. And 
Psalm 127 says this, it says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring are a reward from him. Perhaps that's the news that someone needs to hear today, that they are a reward. Um, but it says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. It says, blesses the man whose quiver is full of them. And so our hope is not to always have our kids living inside of the quiver. But like an arrow, that they are, they're eventually going to be propelled into the world, and there's a target that we're trying to help them aim for of taking their faith serious, making Jesus the center of their life, wanting to be used by God to make kingdom impact, and to, like, to propel them into the world. And so we're, we take responsibility for that, and we partner with the church family and other people, but it is our goal to try to raise them up in such a way that, that they actually become you know, followers of Jesus, men and women in this world, um, and not just relying on our faith for the rest of their life, mm-hmm. right? Um, so parenting conviction number two, uh, there's no formula to parenting, but relying on the Holy Spirit and prayer are non-negotiable. Uh, so just, pause for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious if there's a charismatic church here or not. Like when she says there's no one way or perfect way to parent kids, can I get an amen? Amen. amen. The rest of you are control freaks. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, there's not a one-size-fits-all yeah. or right way to parent, and um, there's no guarantee that if we do things just right, our kids are going to turn out great and love Jesus. Um, so it's only by God's grace. But um, I was reading one time, I think, feeling um, just kind of frustrated with all my different personalities and not sure what to do and how to parent each of them. Um, And I came across this verse in Isaiah 28, uh, 27 through 29, and it says this. It's it's not a parenting verse, so uh, just keep that in mind. A a heavy (laughs) sledge, it's actually about farming, but a heavy sledge is never used to thresh black cumin. Rather, it is beaten with a light (laughs) stick. A threshing wheel is never rolled on cumin. (laughs) Instead, it is beaten lightly with a flail. See what I mean? Uh, Grain for bread is easily crushed, so he doesn't keep on pounding it. He threshes it under the wheels of a cart, but he doesn't pulverize it. The Lord of heaven's armies is a wonderful teacher, and he gives the farmer great wisdom. Uh, So I love this because just like seeds, like different seeds need a different threshing process. And threshing is the process of loosening the edible part of the grain or other crop from the straw to which is it is attached. So as parents, there's, it's our call to do that something similar. We're pulling out what is good in our kids, right? And but each child requires kind of that a different process. Like there's no right way to do it for every um, child. And so Connor, our youngest, he needs like a very direct form of correction. Uh, whereas Hope, who's our nine-year-old um, sweet, sensitive soul, needs us to just come alongside her and be soft and explain the why and explain the reasoning. So there's just no formula. But there is a God who knows the specific needs of our specific kids in specific circumstances. And he is a wonderful teacher. Um, There's a passage that talks about God being the revealer of mysteries. And sometimes we just need that God to reveal the mysteries of our children um, so that we can parent them well. But we just really ultimately need to rely on the Holy Spirit to teach us. And we're the first people. We love parenting books and wise counsel. Those are wonderful resources. But um, I think the first and foremost, we need to go um, to the Holy Spirit to ask. For and, help. I would, and I would just I'd brag on my wife in this, in this manner because I feel like I, I've watched her many times and we have things that have come up with our kids that um, there's things that will yield from other places, but she'll just, just get to her knees and begin praying and contending and asking God what to do. And, and she'll come back with like, well, what if we tried this? Um, and her fighting in prayer and taking time to listen at times that, God, knowing the exact nature and demeanor of our kid's heart, um, I'm amazed at the ways that sometimes that, that she comes back and applies something, and it was exactly what was best for that kid, and it may not have been effective for another child, um, but it puts us in a place of dependence and seeking God, uh, no matter which child and their personality. Yeah, but our confession is, I am always looking for a formula. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really just want to know exactly how to do it and what to do and when to do it. And um, it is not my nature to just trust. Like, I want to know how to do things. Um, and so I just, uh, I think that it's, it's messy and it's hard. And 
we just don't really always know. We're not always that great at going right to God first. Um, a quick story. So when my daughter Elise was born, my niece was born three months earlier um, to my sister Julie. And Elise was born... Uh, Oh, goodness. She, with just a set of lungs. She just <laughs> lit up the room when That's she cried. That's what the nurse, the nurse said, right? Yes. When she was born, she uh-huh. wow, she's got some lungs. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and so I, Kira, who was my niece, was um, put on Baby Wise. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Baby Wise, but my sister used Baby Wise, and Kira was sleeping through the night within, like, four weeks time, and she was just the best baby sleeper, wonderful, and I just could not figure it out. Elise was not sleeping through the night. It was not working for her. And we were trying it. We were trying it. I tried so hard to get that to work, and it never did, and I think that I just learned so quickly, like, Elise is not Kira. I can't do the same thing for her as I am for my own child, because she's a different she's a different person and now that she's older i kind of understand why (laughs) that his sleeping habits but (laughs) (laughs) true um but yeah i think that's where though coming back to the thing that we can control if you will um is is that idea of how do we keep putting it back into god's hands over and over again and praying diligently for them yeah um i think prayer is really the only thing that i oftentimes feel like I can control. And so most times my prayer is, God, I don't know what to do. Like, God, I don't know what to do. Help me. Mm -hmm. Um, And help Elise or Shepard or Hope or Connor. Help them to discover who you are and know who you are. Because really, it's not about our perfect parenting. It's about them experiencing the Holy Spirit. Um, And so there is a passage in Isaiah 62, which I came across that... um, in one of my um, times of just deep prayer for my kids where I was just so discouraged. Um, But it says this, because I love Zion, I will not keep still. And so this is actually Isaiah praying for Jerusalem. Um, And so that's what this is. But it says, because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn. O Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work, until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. And so I just, I love that because it just shows his heart for Jerusalem and just how he cries out and he says, Lord, I'm not going to give you any rest. I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray and I'm going to pray some more. I'm going to post watchmen on the the doors to to pray with me. And so um, parents, like, pray for your kids and invite other people to pray for your kids as well because really that's the only thing that we honestly can can do sometimes and control. Yeah. And so that's a little bit of us in terms of the marriage and parenting and confessions and convictions um, but kind of coming at that last point of just the need and dependence of the Holy Spirit and to be a people of prayer, like that's our heart for our family, but it's ultimately also our heart for the family of God, that we would come to uh, our glorious bridegroom, our incredible Heavenly Father, and seek Him in everything that we do um, and just continually put it back into His hands over and over again. And one of the things we love to do just as we kind of close out our time of, of sharing is is for us to do that together um, in taking communion or the Lord's Supper with one another. And so if you have your elements, if you got those when you came in this morning, I'd love for you to take those out. And um, these, these elements represent to us a deep need and dependence uh, on our God and what our God did to show that he is dependable that he is faithful, that we can trust him and continue to come to him over and over and over again, no matter whatever stage of life we find ourselves in. And so I want us to take communion this morning as a family of God, whether you are married and have kids, whether you are yet to be married and you're single and have no kids, perhaps you're single and you're co-parenting kids, perhaps you're a blended family, um, or maybe you're glorious empty nesters, which is the goal for all of us someday. Um, All of us are part of God's family and invited to the table and to put our allegiance and our dependence on Jesus. And so, if you would, would you take the bread first? And we're gonna take this bread, which represents Christ's body, which was broken. 
when he died in our place for the sins we've committed, the places that we fall short, he said, I'll pick it up for you and I'll actually pay the price on your behalf because I love you so much. And he was crucified on our behalf. So let's take and eat and remember Christ's body being broken. And the next we'll take of this juice, or the wine that would have been what they had with Jesus at that last supper, representing Jesus' blood being poured out and a covenant starting that's completely etched in grace, not off our performance, but ultimately what Jesus has done. And him saying, I have covered over your sin. And so now come to me freely. I'll place my spirit in you. I will be your source of strength. I will be your wonderful teacher. And I am committed to you for forever. And so we remember that as Jesus' blood was poured out, we have grace upon grace. Let's drink together and remember. Love to pray for us as we close. So God, we thank you for this moment. We ask that you would just help us, God, rely on you. Whatever single of life or season of life we find ourselves in, God, whatever place, God, you would have us moving towards that we would keep depending on you. And we thank you, God, that you are a wonderful teacher, that your grace abounds and we need it again and again and again and again. Thank you, God, for the diversity of expression and experience in this place, God, that we can learn from one another, that we do not have to do this thing alone, but God, we are family together. And so, Lord, let us be humble yet confident in the things that we have done well, and also, God, confession, God, when we struggle and say, I need help, and Lord, that we would be a people that lift each other up. And God, thank you that that example is ultimately found in you, Jesus, as your body was broken, your blood poured out to bring healing to each one of us and healing to the world. And God, we want to also be used to bring that healing to the world in Jesus' name, whose name we pray in. All God's people said, amen. 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 Thanks, Cease Few. She did great, right? Uh-huh. This way.